Welcome to the Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery keynote lecture series. This lecture about laryngotracheal trauma is brought to you by the Thoracic Surgery Department at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Our discussion of laryngotracheal trauma will begin with an introduction. We will then discuss the most common mechanisms of injuries that result in laryngotracheal trauma, its presentation, and how to diagnose it. Then we will talk about how to classify and manage these injuries and identify the long-term complications. Finally, we will end with a case report. Historically, laryngotracheal trauma is a rare entity and accounts for only one in every 30,000 emergency room visits in the United States. It is the second most common cause of death in patients with head and neck trauma after intracranial injury. Only 0.5% of multiple trauma patients were reported to have injury to the airway at any level. Laryngeal injuries are therefore often missed due to their infrequency and resultant low clinical suspicion. One retrospective study from Tulane University found that the overall mortality for patients that sustain injury to the tracheobronchial tree was 17%, with the mortality of trauma to the cervical trachea reported as 14%. Blunt trauma is by far the most common mechanism of tracheal injury. The largest review of blunt airway trauma looked at 265 patients over 123 years and unsurprisingly found that the predominant mechanism was following a motor vehicle collision, which accounted for 59% of these injuries. This usually occurs when the driver's extended neck hits the steering wheel, dashboard, or windshield. Fortunately, the frequency of these injuries has declined due to the presence of airbags, increased use of seat belts, and improved dashboard designs. Other mechanisms of blunt injury include sports and as a result of hanging or strangulation. Penetrating injuries are much less common and are usually due to stab or bullet wounds. Iatrogenic injuries are extremely uncommon and may occur during percutaneous tracheostomy unskilled or emergent intubation, or bronchoscopy. Presenting symptoms include dyspnea, dysphonia, hoarseness, strider, neck pain, dysphagia, and hemoptysis. Physical exam findings may include tenderness over the larynx, subcutaneous emphysema, cyanosis, air escaping from a neck wound, large air leak after chest tube placement, or a persistent pneumothorax despite chest tube placement. It is important to remember that the severity of symptoms does not always correspond with the extent of the injury. After the airway has been stabilized, a complete trauma assessment must be performed to assess the degree of injury to the airway and evaluate for other organ injuries due to the high probability of concurrent injuries associated with laryngeal trauma. The esophagus is the most common site of associated injury in tracheobronchial trauma, and the carotid artery is the most commonly injured vessel. The evaluation usually begins with a chest x-ray in the trauma bay that may show a pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, subcutaneous emphysema, or tracheal deviation. A CT scan of the neck and chest is indicated in stable patients and can diagnose most laryngeal fractures and dislocations as well as identify associated injuries. Injury to major vessels and the thyroid gland are also commonly seen. A CT angiogram may also be indicated if there is suspicion for concomitant vascular injury. Direct visualization with flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy is very important in diagnosing airway injury at any level. Rigid bronchoscopy is usually not necessary it is important to remember to pull back the endotracheal tube in an intubated patient to allow examination of the entire airway. Esophagoscopy and barium swallow should be obtained in patients with suspected esophageal injury. MRI and MRA currently have no role in the evaluation of laryngotracheal trauma. There have been many proposed classification systems for laryngeal trauma that categorize injuries according to site, 
tissues injured, and severity. The American Academy of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery has accepted the Schaefer classification system as the most useful since it allows the clinician to make treatment decisions based on severity of injury. Evaluation and management considerations based on the Schaefer group of injury can be seen on this slide. Every laryngeal injury is unique and the management can therefore be complex. The immediate goal is always to obtain a stable airway. Patients with respiratory distress or increasing strider should be intubated immediately and one should have a low threshold to intubate with the aid of a fiber optic bronchoscope. Overall management depends on the mechanism, site of injury, and the presence of associated injuries. We will now go through management considerations based on the site of injury. Hyoid bone fractures are rare and are usually a result of strangulation, sports, or a motor vehicle accident. In a review of 46 patients that sustained hyoid bone fractures, only 5 underwent surgical repair. 15 patients required tracheostomy and surgical intervention for related injuries. Most patients were treated with voice rest, diet changes, and symptomatic analgesia. And both surgical and non-operative management yielded positive patient outcomes with resolution of symptoms. Therefore, non-surgical management of a fractured hyoid bone is the most common method of treatment. If pain over the hyoid bone persists, some groups advocate excising the bone on either side of the fracture to prevent crepitus. The thyroid and cricoid cartilage is ossified during early childhood. Therefore, the age of the patient can influence the pattern of injury. A calcified laryngeal complex in an older patient may fracture in more than one place as depicted here in figure one. Whereas a more elastic larynx will usually fracture at a single site in a younger person, as depicted here in figure two. Fracture occurs when the thyroid cartilage is forced against the cervical spine, flattens, and then springs back into position, resulting in an anterior linear fracture down the thyroid prominence. Non-displaced fractures of the thyroid cartilage that have no evidence of internal derangement on endoscopy can be managed non-operatively with supportive measures, such as head of bed elevation, voice rest, application of cool humidified air, steroids, and anti-reflux medications. All displaced fractures of the thyroid cartilage should undergo open reduction by a low cervical thyroidectomy incision and should be realigned with a mini plate, wire, or non-absorbable monofilament suture. Mini plate fixation was shown to be superior to suture or wire fixation because it promotes complete cartilaginous union, whereas the latter two methods promote healing by fibrous union. The external perichondrium of the cartilage should always be reapproximated. Closed reduction of small fractures or arytenoid dislocations followed by endoscopic placement of an airway stent has been trialed. However, the experience is limited with unfavorable results. Therefore, surgical intervention should be done by an open procedure. If there is also evidence of internal derangement on preoperative endoscopy, such as an evolved vocal cord or displaced epiglottis, this must be repaired after the cartilage to ensure that a proper scaffold is obtained before realigning the mucosa. The laryngeal lumen can be accessed either through the fracture itself or via a laryngofissure midline incision through the thyroid cartilage. Mucosal defects are repaired with absorbable suture and buried knots to prevent granuloma formation. If there is extensive mucosal loss, free grafts from the buccal mucosa skin or dermis may be used to fix the defect. Injury to the cricoid cartilage is often also associated with a fractured thyroid cartilage. Since the cricoid is a complete ring, it usually fractures in two places, anteriorly and posteriorly. Non-displaced, stable fractures can be managed non-operatively. If the fractured segments are unstable, the cartilage should be wired and a soft stent, such as one made of silicone, 
should be inserted and kept in place for about four to six weeks. Patients with crushed cricoid rings should have a tracheostomy placed on presentation, and the cricoid should be excised in a delayed fashion once the surrounding edema has improved. This usually only requires excision of the anterior half of the cartilage, which can be replaced with a hyoid bone or rib graft. Airway stents are often placed in the setting of massive endolaryngeal injury to prevent mucosal adhesions and laryngeal stenosis. Another indication for use is for laryngeal injuries in which the anterior commissure is disrupted. Stent placement helps to maintain the proper alignment of the commissure and prevent anterior glottic webs. In general, however, if a robust repair of mucosa and full reduction and stabilization of the laryngeal fracture can be achieved, it is preferable to avoid the use of stents given their potential complications. These complications include infection, granulation tissue and scar formation, and pressure necrosis, which is usually caused by using stents that are too large for the airway. Scarring from stents may lead to stenosis and impaired vocal cord mobility. There is a large variety of hollow and molded stents that vary in size, shape, and material. The main classes of stents used are silicone, metal, and hybrid. Stent choice remains controversial and is usually surgeon dependent. However, silicone stents are generally preferred. On average, stents are usually left in place for two weeks and bronchoscopically removed in the operating room. Tracheal transection is usually fatal and patients will rarely survive to present to the emergency ward. In cases where the cervical trachea is completely transected, a transverse incision is made and an endotracheal tube is inserted into the distal trachea, as seen here in figure 4. In the operating room, the entire anterior chest should be prepped and draped into the operative field so that a median stenotomy can be performed if needed. Devitalized tracheal tissue and ragged edges should be debrided. However, care must be taken to conserve as much remaining tracheal tissue as possible. Repair of the trachea is performed in an end-to-end -end interrupted fashion. Absorbable 4 sutures are placed through all tracheal layers at an interval distance of 3 to 4 millimeters. Care should be taken to preserve the vessels that run along both lateral aspects of the trachea in order to prevent ischemia that will impair healing of the repair site and promote stricture development. Internal stents are usually not necessary. At the end of the operation, a stay suture is placed between the patient's chin and the chest to prevent neck extension and disruption of the repair. The stitch is removed after the anastomosis has healed and has been surveilled by flexible bronchoscopy, usually on post-operative day 7. If both the trachea and esophagus have been injured, they should each be repaired primarily. The esophagus must be repaired in two layers. A flap of muscle, parietal pleura, or pericardium, as available, should be interposed between the two repair sites to promote healing and prevent the development of a tracheoesophageal fistula. In patients who have more distal injuries to both the thoracic trachea and esophagus that has caused mediastinal contamination, the trachea should be primarily repaired and a cervical spit fistula should be constructed for esophageal diversion with concurrent placement of a gastrostomy or jejunostomy feeding tube. The esophagus should be reconstructed several weeks later, after the tracheal repair has fully healed. Delayed management of tracheal injury may result in a reduction in voice quality, and changes in voice are commonly seen, especially in patients who undergo extensive reconstructive procedures of the larynx. 21% of patients who underwent surgical repair of the larynx for trauma had post-operative voice changes. Long-term speech therapy is therefore imperative in the rehabilitation of these patients. We will now conclude our lecture with a case report. This case involved a 52-year-old man who fell from standing while doing some garden work onto a sharp object and impaled his anterior neck in the midline at the base of zone 2. The object that he fell on was the spike of this cow lawn ornament which measured about 10 centimeters long and was about 2 to 3 centimeters wide at the base. He was reportedly ambulatory at the scene and was able to talk and mentate with minimal dyspnea.
He was taken to an emergency department, where he was intubated for airway protection, and was then brought to the MGH, intubated and sedated. He had a 2 centimeter penetrating wound about midway between the thyroid cartilage and sternum, and had small air bubbles emanating from the wound with some subcutaneous emphysema. On probing the wound with the sterile glove, there was no palpable tracheal injury. There was no hematoma or bleeding evident from the neck wound. Initial chest x-ray showed an endotracheal tube in position without an obvious pneumothorax. Given that the patient had subcutaneous emphysema, an airway injury was suspected and he was taken to the operating room for exploration. First, an EGD was performed that showed no injury to the esophagus. Next, a bronchoscopy was performed to evaluate for any airway injury. Here we can see a defect in the right anterior aspect of the trachea, just distal to the end of the endotracheal tube and about 2 cm proximal to the carina. To repair the injury, a low collar incision was made and a partial stenotomy was performed. The innominate artery was then encircled and retracted. The endotracheal tube was switched to an extra long tube that traversed the injury and allowed for left mainstem bronchus intubation. Interrupted forovicral stitches were placed through all layers of the trachea to reapproximate the defect. The left thymic lobe was mobilized and brought up to cover the suture line. To conclude, a 15 French Blake drain was placed in the neck and a temporary stitch was placed between his chin and his chest to prevent him from extending his neck and compromising his tracheal repair. Postoperatively, he was extubated and monitored in the ICU for a day. His neck drain was removed on post-op day 4, and surveillance bronchoscopy performed on post-op day 7 showed that his tracheal repair was completely intact with taut sutures. His chin stitch was then cut, and he was discharged on postoperative day 8. He had no long-term issues at his one-month follow-up. This concludes our lecture on laryngotracheal trauma.